Welcome to Mirage, speculating on speculative fiction. Tonight, Chris Heron, star of Tall Tale TV, is joining me to discuss Kevin Hearn. He's a fantasy author, isn't he? High fantasy? Elves uh, and urban like that? fantasy, for the most part. Urban fantasy. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. Um, what, what brought you, uh, what brought him to your attention? Um, so I found him the way I find most of my, uh, uh, you know, classically published authors. I just kind of browse around on um, Overdrive <laughs> looking for fun looking uh, covers. Oh. So, yeah, I look for audiobooks on there and I, I saw his stuff and it looked pretty cool. So I gave it a shot and he became one of my favorite authors. He does not have a Wikipedia page. Really? <laughs> I don't can't I don't find it anyway. <laughs> What's that? The Iron Druid Chronicles do. Oh, really? Yeah. Try and pull him up on Wikipedia. So you've read all of them. Is that what Not the... quite. I'm still working my way through. I, I'm uh, up to the eighth novel. And he's got, in that series, he's got, if I understand right, nine novels. And then like a million little uh, novelettes. <laughs> and so I've read, I've, or I've listened to uh, seven of the novels. And a lot of the uh, little short story novelettes and stuff like that. And he is, uh, you said classically published. I mean, traditionally published. Yeah, I think it's, uh, gosh, I I think it's Penguin. I'm wow, Penguin. Sure. It's a big guy. I, I could be wrong on that. I'm looking at his Amazon right now. Let's see if I can pull it. I said Delray, actually. Oh, okay. Delray is an imprint of somebody. I'm not quite sure 100% who he is. Um, I think I was telling you before we got started. When you told me you wanted to do him, I looked him up. I'm like, huh, I wonder if I can get him on the podcast. So I sent him a message, and he immediately responded, no. But he oh. responded, no. <laughs> He's pretty active on Twitter. It's it's amazing that you could actually reach out to a lot of these authors and actually talk to them. Yeah. When I was a kid, I mean, you couldn't do that. You read a Anne Rice book, that was it. I mean, maybe you could show up at a book signing or something along those lines and maybe meet her for a second. But you are actually able to interact with these people on the internet. <laughs> yeah, I actually uh, sent a, a letter to um, uh, um, Pierce Anthony when I was a young kid. Oh, really? <laughs> but I think that's the only time I tried to contact you know, a traditionally published author. What happened? And what happened to that? I'm not sure if my parents even mailed it. I was pretty young, so I think first grade. <laughs> oh, okay. That's interesting, right? I mean... But I mean, I can reach out to him and he can respond no to me in a very polite way within less than a day. Uh, there's a woman by the name of Celeste Ding. Uh, she is a, I think she went to Harvard. She wrote a book that is being made into a movie with Reese Witherspoon and a bunch of other people. And I interact with her almost every single day. Wow. It's, like, it's crazy. The world that we live in, this modern technology, it allows us to reach out to people that we would consider gods in a different time. You know what I mean? <laughs> yep. um, but Kevin Hearn, does he classify as God to you in urban fantasy? Is he one of the better ones? Yeah, yeah. Um, he actually kind of uh, is one of my favorite urban fantasy writers. I put him up there with like the Dresden Files and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Uh, what makes him so good? What What uh, actually – yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. What makes him so good? <laughs> um, so he's really good at characters. I'll give uh -huh. him that. And uh, the magic system is nothing to write home about, but it's good enough. You know, it, it's not like with uh, um, Rothfuss, you know, where it's like this really in-depth and you get to learn all the different aspects of how this thing works and everything like that. It's just kind of closer to your, you know, he can do it because he can do it kind of thing with a little bit more than that. But it's the, the characters and the world building and everything like that because it's one of those ones where it has all the pantheons you know, of all the different gods and everything like that. So this main character is the last druid, and he's been around since, I think, the Iron Age. You know, mm -hmm. he's, been, uh, he's over 2,000 years old, and he's just trying to blend in. So he kind of looks like a hipster, you know, or acts like one, I should say. And uh, he has, like, a bookstore and stuff like that. But then he kind of gets sucked back into these old feuds he had with the, you know, Irish gods and everything like that. And he just kind of you know, snowballs and he ends up uh, fighting with all these different pantheons and it's just the world building is awesome. Oh, it's fantastic. And <clears throat> with uh, urban fantasy, you want it to be a world that you can recognize as you writing in Earth or is it a different world entirely? Just one Absolutely. that we can... 
yeah it's, it's earth. earth it's right now you know you could walk out the door and see him on the street you know kind of thing that's crazy i found kevin hearn's wikipedia page <laughs> <laughs> just searching his name i could not find it but now i have it and that's really disappointing it's three sentences long really? it's, uh, it says kevin hearn is an american urban fantasy novelist born and raised in arizona Hearn is the author of eight novels published by Del Rey in the fantasy book series, The Iron Druid Chronicles, plus 2015's Star Wars novel, Heir to the Jedi. His novel, oh. Trickled, made the New York Times bestseller list, and his novel, novel Shattered, was his first work released in hardcover and was on the USA Today's bestseller list. Um, and he's a high school English teacher. Was, hey, you moved to Colorado. So he's a neighbor of yours. Really? Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, I wonder cool. where he lives. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Um, my wife won't let me live in Colorado. She said you guys own too many guns. Uh, okay. <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> We're not Texas. <laughs> uh, she doesn't like open carry states at all. I don't have no clue if Colorado even classifies as that. Oh, yeah, I guess we do. That's right. My neighbor's one of those. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, but he's a good guy. I've known him since high school. Well, they, I guess I read recently that open carry guys are probably more the law-abiding as citizens that we have in this country. Tend to be middle class and very upstanding and whatnot. But it always shocks me when you walk into a situation and you see somebody with a gun on their belt. It's like, huh, yeah. I can make you mad and die. Yep. <laughs> I think if anybody yep. in a truck has a gun. But uh, yeah, so he is a, a Coloridian, if that's how you call it call yourselves like i think best. it's coloradan is what most people say but i'm Colorado. not yeah i'm not sure <laughs> arizona too so maybe he lives, likes the desert um, the, the books actually of... start in tempe arizona oh really okay uh, and where do they end he up must at? have lived there for a while because he does a really good job because I, I was born in arizona and it's uh -huh. like reading this stuff it's like yep he nailed it <laughs> he graduated from northern arizona university so i'm not really quite sure where that is that is flagstaff not oh, flagstaff is really nice oh, okay. been through there it's not really deserty i don't think i don't know i've only been through arizona i've never stopped i try to fill up in new mexico and get all the way through to nevada <laughs> <laughs> it is hot that's for yeah, sure exactly um what part of uh, you grew up in tempe you said no no uh, that's where the the books start um i was born in tucson Oh, okay. Uh, we that's... moved up here when I was seven. That's I don't remember too, too much of it, but you know, we'd always go down and visit family. So. Oh, really? It's very yep. deserty down there. In Tucson? Yeah. 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 My I... my grandparents lived in like um, uh, can't even think of the place. It was much greener wherever they lived, so that was nice. Uh, -huh. what part of Colorado do you live? Again, I think it's like Fort Collins, or no, I live between Fort Collins and Denver, a uh, oh, little okay. bit north of Boulder, I guess. It's but, nice, right? Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah it's a nice been, place. I've been to Denver once. It was gorgeous. And the mountains right there. But uh, yeah, so Kevin Hearn lives in Colorado. He based his novel in Tempe, Arizona. For the first couple, yeah. Where'd they end up? Where oh, geez, where from? did they end up? Um, so, I mean, they, they start in Tempe, and then at one point they go to a Navajo reservation, which I think was in Colorado. Interesting. Um, I'm trying to remember where they end up. The, the thing is, is that he can kind of teleport by using this network of uh, trees and fey plains and stuff like that. So in a lot of them, they never really stick around in one place. I know the last thing I saw, they had a cabin in the woods somewhere, and I can't remember where it was. But it might have been Colorado for all I know. <laughs> a portaling. That's interesting. So he really just kind of skips the whole magic thing. Uh, kind of. Kind of. He, he explains it um, with uh, he is a druid, and so he's attuned with Gaia and stuff like that. And so mm -hmm. he can't do any harm, you know, directly. But so he can bind natural elements, but he can't touch anything that's synthetic. Uh, the, the teleportation is because since he's a druid, he's connected to the Fey Plains, and he can go to the fey plane which is where his pantheon of gods lives you know stuff like that so you know they, they they do a lot with uh what he's supposed to be able to do and the reason he's so old is because he learned the uh the herb lore of ermit 
<laughs> and so he learned how to make tea that'll make him young and everything. And he can, you know, take his mind and connect it with his dog. So he talks to his dog, who's kind of the comic relief of the, the series. It's an Irish wolfhound? Yeah, yeah, Oberon. Oberon which, is a dog. <laughs> yes. I was going to ask if Oberon was his. What's the character's name, the main one? So his real name is uh, uh, Shehan, I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, Shehan O'Sullivan, but he goes by Atticus. Oh, uh, so they're Irish. Yes, he is In Irish. A way, or Irish all the way. Yeah, he's redheaded and you know, definitely came from Ireland before the, the Celts were even there. And uh, so I'm watching this video on YouTube. It was basically a book signing. He's with the person who does the audio books. You know, the, the, uh, the, Luke Daniels? The reading. Is that who it is? I'm going to look him up oh, right Luke now. Luke Daniels is one of my favorite narrators. He's oh, amazing. Yeah. yeah. See. Yeah, Luke Daniels uh, and David Podell are probably my two favorites right now. What makes them your favorites? Well, they both have American accents for the most part, but they're very, very diverse, and they're just so good at telling stories. So uh, Podell's the one that does um, the King Killer Chronicles. Oh, okay. Uh, do you do you prefer reading or listening now? I, mean, I know that you, you started this journey of yours with uh, Tall Tale with the um, the listening, but are you still into right. that as so, a mode of um, hearing stories and whatnot? I, I love reading books. I, I definitely do. Most of the content I get through is by listening to audiobooks because I can listen to them at work. Uh, but all the hard copy reading I do, I try to do for like authors I'm working with. Like if they give me an advanced reading copy or something like that, I've got such a huge backlog. So I just try to get, you know, my physical reading done before I go to bed and stuff like that. And so I stick to the authors I'm interacting with, but you know, anything like this, I would do with audiobooks, So I can just do it while I'm doing something else. Yeah. Congratulations on actually dipping back into the writing aspect of, of the art too. I was putting a couple stories out there. <laughs> Every time I get myself in a bind. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? So um, like the, the last one I put out, uh, I think it was uh, small gods in big trouble. Um, I had a massive audio problem with the uh, the story I was supposed to have last week or the week before. And so I couldn't get it recorded again in time and I couldn't contact any authors with their stories and, you know, expect to get a good, decent story out of it, you know, like a, a quality narration. And so mm -hmm. I just busted that out as quick as I could and did. And it's like, I hope anybody doesn't, you know, hate it. <laughs> but... What kind of reaction are you getting? Not much, actually. Oh. So I don't think I had any comments on that whatsoever. But that's fine by me, as long as I don't get, you know, you suck, you know. <laughs> yeah, that would be the worst. But people are generally pretty nice, right? In terms of you create something that can really jump down your throat about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, think... you you would hope that you get some criticism and be able to grow as an artist, but then nothing happens. And you're like, huh, right. okay. If you're a positive person, you think, huh, they liked it and they just didn't want to tell me. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and on YouTube, guess... you know, people aren't really writers and stuff most of the time when they go there. As far as I can tell, I could be wrong. And so I'm not getting as many comments about the writing quality and stuff like that that you would if you posted it on Reddit, you know, where you're looking for feedback. So it's kind of a, a different medium, I think, as far as the feedback goes. Yeah. Um. So how are, how is your channel going right now? Great. Um, I'm actually posting my 100th episode Monday. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. And, and then uh, my one year anniversary is uh, the 13th. So that's coming up next week or the week after, I guess. Uh, and then um, uh, I just hit my 500 subscriber mark. So. 500 subscribers is pretty good. Um, can you monetize now with that? Or are you still pretty much in the doldrums with with the uh, the YouTube Oh, um, yeah, technically right I'm still uh, unqualified for uh, that. And actually I've done a lot of thinking on that aspect and I'm not going to ever monetize my videos. At least I don't plan on it. You know, maybe uh -huh. eventually I can monetize and I'll give that money to the author or something like that. But um, I'm just building my, uh, I guess, my brand as a narrator and kind of honing my skills so I can get going professionally. I'm actually taking classes to read professionally. Oh, interesting. What kind of, what are they like? Uh, they're pretty cool. I'm working with a guy named Sean Crisden. Uh, he's fairly big in the uh, the romance area, I guess. You know, and he's pretty talented. So I got really lucky. But um, 
he's kind of teaching uh, me how to act and stuff like that a little bit better. Interesting. Do you look back on what you've already produced and kind of cringe or is it more like, oh, okay, I've been doing that naturally? <laughs> uh, if I look back at my really early stuff, yeah, I, I can cringe, but I mean, it's not horrible or anything like that. It's just, I know I could do so much better now, but so I, I don't feel bad about any of it because I had to do that to get, you know, to the point that I am now. And I know a year from now, I'm going to look back to here and it's like, yeah, I could have done better, but you know, it's just learning process. Yeah, everything's a learning process. Getting stuff out there is the hardest part. You know, hitting publish. I don't know if we talked about that, but just getting things out there is incredibly difficult. Yeah. Um, so what does Luke no, Wilson, uh, Luke, Daniels? Luke Daniels teach you about audio? Oh, um, wait. Uh, Luke Daniels is the guy who did the Kevin Hearn books. Are you talking yes. about him or about Sean Christen? Okay. No, Luke yeah, Daniels. I don't know Sean I'm looking at Luke Daniels' uh, Twitter account actually in front of me right now. <laughs> gotcha. Um, actually, it's kind of synergetic having these classes and listening to it because it's like my teacher, Sean, will uh, tell me about a reverence for punctuation where it's like you got to make sure you have these pauses in the right spot. And then I'll listen to Luke Daniels and I see exactly what he's talking about, you know. But then uh, Luke's just um, – he's so good at acting and putting the emotion in there where it needs to be and the voices are so good. You know, it's just, it, it's fun to listen to and occasionally I'll pick something up as far as, oh, that's how you do that, you know. With the, the video I was watching, um, Hearn, I want to add an S so bad to his name. Hearn was talking about how the director kind of messed up a lot of pronunciation with his his character names and places and things like that. Do you run into that? Where authors are like, dude, you messed that up completely. I think once or twice, but, um, and I mean, all narrators, at least most ones that I know of really, really try to communicate with the author about, and it's like this, I don't know how to pronounce it. And a lot of time it's actually the author's name, you know? Yeah. Um, but th I've had some really bizarre names come across, but, um, uh, yeah, I, I try my best to, to get it right. And I've only had one person who's like, yeah, you got that wrong, but I don't really care. It was good anyway. I would think that's the way I would go as well if you messed up from pronunciation. I can't actually listen to any of the stories that you put up on, on your channel that I've written. It just drives me absolutely crazy. I keep waiting for my, my the ball to drop on something I've written. I'm like, okay, that's good, that's good, that's good. I hope nothing comes up that sounds bad, and I have to stop. It, the anxiety just gets to me completely. So, I mean, you could just be messing <laughs> all the pronunciations up, and I would never know. I wouldn't even know. You can just like read like five <laughs> minutes of the story and I wouldn't even know what comes after. <clears throat> <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's with, with, oh, sorry. I was going to say no. with uh, Kevin Hearn, I guess um, I, I feel really bad for Luke Daniels because he uses a lot of old Irish names. And it's like, yeah, I listen to Luke, you know, Daniels say them. It's like Shea Han O'Sullivan. But then you go and you actually see how it's written. It's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, that's basically how I read complicated names anyway. I just either skip by them or just assume in a, a pronunciation that's usually wrong. Um, <laughs> it's the guy you know, with the red hair. I know who it is. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's the main character with the spelling of a name like that. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> that's the best part about reading is it turns into your own universe. And if the author is good enough, I mean, you just take it as your own. Um, yeah. And the mythologies are mythology. It's earth mythology. He's writing yeah. about Irish Druids and that kind and then, of. Yeah. So you got the Irish, you know, the, the Morgan and, um, you know, uh, Briet and all those over there in the old Irish pantheon. And then you've got like Thor and Odin and stuff like that. And then you've got uh, the um, uh, the more uh, uh, trying to think Scandinavian gods and you've got uh, Navajos and you, you know, you got the the Aztecs at one point and Egyptian and whatever you can think of, you know, the Greek and the Roman, mm -hmm. all those pantheons, anything that's actually existed. I mean, he has a beer with Jesus at one point, you know, really? he's kind of looked like the guy from the old spice commercial. That's fantastic. <laughs> so, that's, that's very interesting. So, I mean, how does he kind of group these mythologies together? Uh, basically are they at war with each other. Is it cultural or are they all like Neil Gaiman kind of hanging out and <laughs> trying to take over? Neil Gaiman's not a bad uh, – you're talking about American Gods, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's not a bad analogy. It's almost like that. They tend to stick a little bit more to themselves in this uh, series. 
So it's like they'll be on their own ethereal plane. You okay. know? So if you want to see the Asgardians, you have to go to Asgard. But they can come down and they can interact and everything like that, especially if you do you know, a dumb thing like you go and kill Thor. Then they all kind of gang up on you and try to kill you. Does that yeah. happen in the stories? Yeah. <laughs> oh, he does? Uh, yeah. Spoiler alert? Or is spoiler that... alert, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you need to that's cut that out, you yeah, no, I'm going to actually make it the beginning of the story so, of the podcast so everybody knows that we're ruining the books immediately. Yeah, that's about that. So. <laughs> I wasn't too worried about saying that. And then go on like a 15 minute monologue that I'll add in after about how you destroyed the whole series for me and I'll never be able to read it. <laughs> <laughs> is it YA or is it, is it adult fiction? Uh, I think it's adult. Yeah, no, it's definitely adult. The The, the guys you know, looks like he's 19, but he's 2,000 years old and snarky as hell. Oh, the Irish guy? They are the main character? Yeah. Wow, the interesting. main character. So, I mean, as far as I know, druids aren't really written in terms of being able to live forever. So he is kind of making up his own mythology with that, isn't he? Yeah, uh, the thing is, one of the reasons he's the last druid is when they were persecuted by the Romans and were killed off and everything like that, had to do with vampires as well, whatever. Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can think of you this. Uh, that's awesome but, uh, though right i mean in terms of writing you get a whole world of possibilities here why not put everything into your novel yeah you could do anything with it but um he uh uh was lucky enough to be contacted by ermit which i think is a deity in the uh old irish thing i'm not exactly sure about that one but she was in is her, it in h-e-r-m-i-t h-e-r-m-i-t like hermit uh, I think so. I, I'm not sure because I've been listening to it. I haven't been actually, you know, reading the text. But um, she she kind of had this whole thing where she knew more about herbs than any other, ex, you know, being in existence. And so she traded him her knowledge for him to go kill her dad at one point, way, way back in the day. And so he learned how to make these teas that could, like, keep him alive forever and stuff like that. So that's how he got around that. <laughs> um. So he has to worship to continue to live or he's based on some no. kind of magic like herbs and just na natural type of druid things that p propel him forward eternally yeah as long as he doesn't you know piss off gaia he's good you know he doesn't have to worship any gods but he does you know he pays homage to all of his old irish deities and stuff like that and he's on first name basis with most of them <laughs> ends up you know getting in bed with a couple of them at some points to his Gaia. dismay. That's Greek but, though, isn't it? God of the earth. I, either way, it's basically just the earth. I don't it's know if that's Greek or what, but yeah, he's, he's just connected to the earth. And so as long as he doesn't mess up that, you know, he can talk to all the elementals of the earth and stuff to have them help him out. And he tries to plant trees and basically be a, a hippie. <laughs> yeah, I wonder, does it, annoy people that he's kind of mixing and matching conveniently the, the gods or whatnot i mean i would be it, like gaia is this is greek so he's irish what does that mean he's actually greek uh, uh, how does this work i mean i know the mythologies are kind of all interlinked i mean you have the greek and the roman and the norse and the germanic and and kind of the uh the what do you call it the the english peoples during that time frame right I mean, they're all basically the same thing. Their pantheons sound very, very familiar. In fact, I'm going to yeah. look up Gaia I mean, and see if it actually has an Irish component to it. Yeah, my guess would be it probably doesn't, and that's why he ended up using it. That would just be my off-the-cuff guess, because there's not that much known about you know the really, really old Irish world. Celtic. My knowledge. <laughs> Celtic is the word Celtic. I was looking for. Oh. Yeah, it's it's before that. Oh, the Celtics. Yeah, uh, if I remember right, I, I could be wrong. It's been so long since I've looked at my ancient Irish stuff, but uh, I think they came from uh, the Bronze Age, and the Celts didn't come in until the uh, the Iron Age or after. I could be wrong. <laughs> don't oh, don't, don't on that. Know. Looking at Celtics we uh, Wikipedia page, my go-to. Uh, and I'm trying to find dates here, and I'm seeing the the Gaelic War 5251, but that's you know when Rome kind of did their thing. So let's see, Celtic history. 
and Celts come up. I don't know. Iron Age, you're right. Looks like people in the Iron Age and med medieval Europe who spoke the Celtic language. And they were all over the place. Nope, I am completely wrong. It looks like they're mainly Ireland, a little bit in England, and maybe a tiny little little stab in France, and that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because I'm I'm writing a uh, a Mexican fairy tale that uses a lot of Aztecian uh, mythology, but nice. I'm not I'm not trying to mix it up or anything. I'm just trying to use that mythology to propel my story forward. And this is a story that I've already written, so I'm kind of go back in and add the spice of the Aztecs into it. And I uh, like that authors are kind of doing that now where they look at the mythologies and are using it instead of making up a whole lore, providing those gods a foothold in our own kind of existence in a way. Yeah. Can you think of everybody else that kind of does that too? I mean, I know we talked about Neil Gaiman does it. Hmm. Uh, I mean, they kind of do that with Supernatural on TV. I've not really ever seen that. I I thought about going on there and trying to find all the Felicia Day episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's good. I, yeah, she's she's awesome. Um, and she had a kid. Did you know that? I did not know did she not. was pregnant, and she had a kid. And I was like, whoa! Thought I was like a stalker. And no, I'm not. <laughs> um, Supernatural does it. Neil Gaiman does it. Kevin Hearn does it. Who else does it? I know it? I there's know. more. I'm just, I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> it's very interesting, though. So, I mean, the magic. I mean, as far as I know, if you look at the mythology or the stories that are told within the mythology, do they have magic? When you look at Medusa, is that a magic that she's wielding? And are there people that have oh. Medusa's kind of power to turn people into stone and things like that? Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess it kind of depends on uh, what aspects you're looking at. Like uh, when he's working with the uh, Navajo uh, individuals, you know, he's talking oh, with Coyote, the deity, and then they have a shaman there at the same time. So the shaman's using magic, and the deity's just kind of, you know, all powerful kind of, you know, stuff going on. Like so the trickster it, god it, type situation? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Coyote's so cool. a really cool character. He He kind of shows up as this you know southern gentleman with his drawl <laughs> so it's it's a lot of fun to listen to his uh his dialogue and whatnot. like a like a white dude no 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 uh he just you know has the cowboy hat and the jeans with the hole in the knee and stuff like oh, that and the, okay yeah that's fascinating that's wonderful <laughs> and getting into the the uh native american mythology too which isn't really done very often I love yeah, the was, that's I mean, the more we're talking books. about this guy, it's kind of like, oh man, he's doing what I like to do now, kind of dig into this mythology and see what's there. Yeah, Pulling like your Odin son story, or not Odin like son. Odin, Odin, and I've done a little bit with the Native Americans too. Um, yeah. Odin's reward, yeah. Yeah, I, I think you'd like him. But... Oh man, my list of books is so big. <sighs> <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> Do, doing jobs like these, or not jobs, but projects like these, you know, it just, it keeps building and it doesn't go down very fast, does it? No, I mean, also you're trying to write too, so it's like, when do you actually read? And I've got twins, so it's yeah. not like I can write until like 3 o'clock and go, okay, I'm going to go read for a few hours. Nope, i got to go pick up my kids and have them run me over <laughs> until it's bedtime. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so yeah, I would love to read more. Um, how is this prose? Uh, good. Is it functional or is it poetic? Uh, no, it's pretty straightforward. You know, it's not, uh, I'd say he's a clever writer, but he's not a flamboyant writer. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Totally. <laughs> so he, he's definitely feels modern. He doesn't feel like he's trying to reinvent the wheel, but you know, he does a really good job and he's with the character being snarky and with his dog being a pop culture sponge. You know, he can put a lot of humor in there, so it's it's. Oh, fun. so the the dog is what kind of provides our voice. Uh, us... Yeah, o Oberon the dog. Uh, he he kind of has his mind linked with Atticus, you know, because he's a druid, so he can talk to animals and whatnot. But uh, uh, he uh, 
he's just he's got this uh love for pop culture and history so it's like uh that bath time atticus will tell him stories about like genghis khan or um you know different people throughout history but then he'll also be watching tv and so he'll be talking about wolfgang puck and you know he's very food oriented and so but he'll give comedic relief to the situations to kind of lighten the mood whenever it's getting a bit too heavy mm -hmm. but it's it's a clever way to keep the the ball rolling in scenes that need something extra and it's shakespeare isn't it oberon is the king of the fairies yeah and maybe for <laughs> renaissance literature or is that just a name that the dog was given yeah or that's just it yeah <laughs> that's pretty cool uh, I mean, 2,000 years is not, you know, obviously the extent of human experience on the planet, but it does give you a lot to play with. Pull yeah. characters in at random. And it would be interesting if he floated in and out of his history and gives you scenes from his past. Um, he has or a whatnot. couple of flashbacks. But oh, really? Yeah. Um, and eventually... You... Oh, go ahead. No, was... go ahead. I was going to say, eventually, his uh, he finds out that his mentor, his arc druid from back in the day, was kind of frozen in time, and so he gets that guy back, and so this cranky old guy from the Iron Age is, you know, wandering around, you know, <laughs> modern day stuff, and you know, it gets quite fun to see the culture shock. So there's that. But... I wonder how much uh, he's got in store. It sounds like a great world to work in. Yeah. One character has 2000 years of experience and oh man i've lost my place on my my bar here how many books does he have out um so in that series uh there is nine and i think that might be all there is but that's just the novels not the uh the, the short no stories i have no idea how many novelettes and short stories he's got there's a ton of them and then he's got a couple other things i know he just came out with a book that was um, about giants in like a giant war and stuff like that. Um, oh, it's fascinating. I, it. I think he's got a couple other things. I think he's, I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up. I'm sorry. What do you, um, what do you think he compares with other contemporaries of his writers and whatnot? I mean, I know you picked him as one of, one of your favorites, but yeah, I mean, who does he match up to? Right. Um, so, I like his prose more than Brandon Sanderson. Wow. But Brandon that... Sanderson, well, <laughs> Brandon Sanderson is amazing. I love the guy. He is just a machine. He can crank stuff oh. out. But these feel like they were a little bit more refined, like more time was spent going back and editing. You know, and that's kind of my only issue with Brandon is that he just goes so fast. You know, sometimes you can tell he didn't spend a lot of time editing, but I love his stuff. Don't get me wrong. I can't um, get into him. I've tried so hard to read one of his novels, and it just uh, I the, you know, the same thing happened to me when I read uh, uh, the Name of the Wind too. I could not get into it for the longest time, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, somebody was saying, "Oh, it's so good, you have to read it." I'm like, "Oh, fine, I'll try it for the twelfth time," and I got hooked. Could not. Yeah, I read that. One. Read it straight through. That one I started three times before I made it past the first couple of chapters, and it's like, "Oh my god, this is the best book ever." Yeah, and that's how I felt. And Sanderson, I've I've done it many times. Picked up one of his books and just could not get through it, and it's so frustrating. Yeah, people keep I, saying I how good he is. <laughs> yeah. I think with him, um, a lot of it is his concept because he actually teaches a class, if I understand right, on how to come up with a really cool concept. And then I think he's a, a pantser writer. You know, fly by the seat of your pants. Mm -hmm. But I'm not positive. But, you know, he definitely has a formula down, and he just cranks stuff out at such a phenomenal pace. You know, <laughs> I'm very envious of his abilities. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people say that's the best way to become popular now, too. The more you write, the the more likely it is that you're going to develop a following. And Amazon is kind of – there's an algorithm at play that makes you look better to readers or pulls your name and puts it above – the dude that writes like one book every year or something along those lines, if you could put out multiple novels or multiple works, oh. you're going to be a, a more popular person. I do you're not gonna, know that. You're going to be more successful. I don't know if he's playing that game, but a lot of the Indies that I talk to are playing that game and they seem to be benefiting from it. I, yeah, I know, know Robert Beers is putting out a lot. 
Oh, really? Yeah, I talked to him yeah. on my podcast. He's a he's a nice guy. I think he got mad at me though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. That. I didn't think so. He's no, actually I mean, up for I... an audiobook award. Oh, really? So, yeah, he's a ABR audiobook award or something like that for his his first novel. So what's he, that he's, mean? He's going... What's that? What is uh, from your work on his audiobook? Oh no no no! He got it through um, Graphic Audio. You know the the movie in your mind. You know audiobook oh, company. Interesting. And he's also in a uh, Facebook group that I had participated in, Knights of the Round Table or Sci Fi of the Round Table or something like that. He seems like a nice guy. I had a great time talking to him. <clears throat> Not that he ever told me I'm, he's mad at me or whatever, but <laughs> I just feel like <laughs> like we talked about earlier. It's just so hard to read all of these books. And I've done like yeah. over 100 interviews already. Near about. Oh, that's right. and... he, he did seem a little shocked when you said you hadn't read anything. Yeah, no. <laughs> I was like, can you imagine if I had to buy the books for everybody I talked to? Yeah. That's like thousands of dollars. I'm like, I can't do that. <laughs> if you yeah. want me to read, you can give me copies of them. But it's almost impossible for me to, you know, write and read and do the podcast. I don't know. <laughs> that's what that's what made me think he was mad. Because <laughs> I know. He, he's, a, he's a really laid back guy. I won't worry about it. So. Um, so man, tall tale TV. It's interesting. I keep thinking about you occasionally and you wonder... sent a few people my way. Have I? Yeah. I can't think of the names right now, but I've got at least two people who you told them about me. And so they came and submitted a story. So, Oh, interesting. Well, that's good. I mean, I, <laughs> I think you're doing a, a decent thing. In fact, I'd like to see Tall Tale kind of expand into, you know, a webzine or something along those lines, or even a podcast. Have you considered that? Yeah, I'm in the process of converting all my audio into single clips, because right now I have like my intro, my story, my author bio, then my outro, and they're all different clips. So uh-huh. I've got to go in and combine them all into single clips. But I am working on converting it all so I can start the podcast. That should be coming out in a, a couple months. Or a oh, month, good for you. I would I'm I listened to uh, um, Beyond, uh, what's it called, uh, Clark's World and Uncanny and all these like magazines have podcasts where they read the stories and it's like it's like perfect for you to, to do something yeah. like that. Yeah, you turned you me on to those, so thank you. Uh, do you listen to them? I have a, cu- a couple of them. Um, I haven't been listening to podcasts, you know, on like Stitcher and stuff like that lately. Mm-hmm. So I need to get back into listening to those. I've been trying to actually beef up on this right here the uh the iron drew chronicles so i've been slacking off on all my podcasts <laughs> oh you were boning up on 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 hern for this podcast yeah. he's got oh, so much cool. stuff and it takes me yeah. you know a week to get through a book but oh a week man i wish it took me that little bit of time unless i'm really into an author or a story it just feels like it drags forever i st- in fact i got candy you know what i mean i like certain books I love military nonfiction. I could pick up a yeah. military nonfiction book and just like never be able to put it down. And now I'm reading the Navy SEAL account of the assassination, <laughs> or not assassination, but the hit on uh, uh, Osama bin Laden. Oh. I love stuff like that so much. <clears throat> I actually started a nonfiction recently. It uh, was narrated by Sean Crisden, my teacher. So I oh. looked him up on Overdrive and I found this. And uh, it's 12 Years a Slave. And it's a story about, you know, um, a made free a movie black man. Oh, did they? Yeah. The, he gets uh, he goes back down to the south and gets captured again as a as a slave. Yeah. And he spends... Oh, yeah, it's such a good book. What well, Academy Award? By the guy. Oh, it's That's written cool. by the freed, the freed slave? Yeah, yeah. He actually wrote the book back in like 1820 something. Oh, interesting. But it's really interesting. I mean, horrible. But it's yeah. just so compelling. I, I couldn't put it down for the longest time, but then I had to to get back to Kevin Hearn. I so. think <laughs> the guy who played the slave in the movie ended up playing Martin Luther King in Selma. He's an oh, English okay. dude. It's very uh, the book. The movie's hard. I'd imagine the book is hard too. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely heavy. <laughs> so, so this guy lives in Colorado, or are you doing like a remote? remote um he's out in uh, california right now so but i think he's in the process of moving and uh you have to pay for it or is it yeah yeah he, okay. he he's he definitely um deserves you know, uh charging <laughs> money because he's, he's amazing but how much did it cost uh I, his 
I don't know if I'm supposed to advertise his rates or not, but I'll, I'll just say he's uh, given me a pretty good deal compared to what you tend to see out there. I but, mean, it's it's definitely good that you're taking it so seriously that you're educating yourself. Yeah, no, I want to do this as a living. You know, I I would love to quit my day job and just narrate audiobooks, keep Tall Tale TV going. You know, that's that's my dream job. So. And do novels eventually? Have you done a novel? I know you were yeah. doing something long form for your wife. I know yeah. uh, Bob Beers loves you. <laughs> <laughs> he gives yeah, you everything doing to read. Right now. <laughs> Are you really? Yeah, it's a uh, uh, where no story has gone before. You know. And I'm actually one of the characters in there. They get sent into this world or, or a, an approximation of this world where his books have basically become the next uh, um, um, big thing on TV, you know, like Supernatural. And so uh -huh. they, they end up going to Comic-Con and meeting themselves and stuff like that. So it's very meta. Uh -huh. But I, I end up being in there. I'm like, are you Tony Mandolin? <laughs> I narrate your books. So I had a buddy that I went to high, uh, college with that looks just like his character that he has. In yeah. <laughs> if he ever does a movie, <laughs> I, he's an actor too. That's it's crazy how much he looks like him. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, going back to Kevin Hearn, okay. uh, obviously he's popular. Obviously people yes. like his work. I mean, he's written nine books in the series, uh, the iron druid chronicles. Um, he's done other work too, and it seems like he's going the route of. I mean, how long has he been writing? When was his first book published? Delray sure. is one of those big guys too. I mean, that's like, I think it's an imprint of Tor. Or it might be Penguin. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. You look up something, and then you end up with Delray, a neighborhood in Alexandra, Alexandria, Virginia. <laughs> No, it's not what I wanted. Delray Publishers. All right, let's see. Right, did I misspell it? Probably. Looks Random like House. the first book was 2011. So he's only been going seven years. Wow. And nine That's books good. in the series, and then he has like a bunch of other stuff that aren't is, that aren't is not connected to this series at all. Right, and then a ton of smaller books, you know, short sure, fiction and whatnot novel. too. I would imagine, and, and he was a teacher. Novellas. novellas. Yeah, I keep saying novelette, and I know that's not right. It's novella. <laughs> I need to get that right. Well, I mean, it could be a novelette too. That's like just a little bit over nine thousand words in between twelve thousand, I believe. Yeah, and these are a bit longer than that. If I if my guess is correct, I would I would consider them novellas. But and that's anything under forty thousand. So like I think that's right. 40. Depends on who you ask. <laughs> yeah. I know that's my that's my goal. Every time I start a novel, is at least forty thousand words. Nice. Um. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm only like two novels complete at this particular point in time, and it's not like I'm actually getting published. So <laughs> it's terribly frustrating. Um, damn, what was I looking for? My brain, I don't know why I do podcasts this late. Like, my you, brain is done. <laughs> done. You you were looking up uh, who owned um, Delta. Uh, oh, it's Random the, House. Oh, it's Random House. Okay. And it's Penguin. Pangu Penguin Random House. Founded in 1977. Okay. So I wasn't too far off earlier. <laughs> no, they do on tour. Oh, no, they don't. I have no clue what I'm talking about, <laughs> which is unfortunate. Piers Anthony connected to Delray. So, I mean, that's, you know, going back to yeah. him. I think <laughs> I he's still <laughs> Really? I think so. He is 83 years old. He was my hero for the longest time when I was younger. You know, it wasn't until I found Robin Hobb that I started moving away from his stuff. But Robin Hobb, man, you are a definite spec fiction fan, huh? <laughs> Oh, oh, Robin uh, Hobb is a woman. Robin Hobb yeah. just died, didn't she? No. Did she? I'm trying to I think. I don't not. think so. I don't think so. Robin Hobb. God, I've read so many books and so many different genres. I definitely have not read that many series. What does she have? Four series and then some standalones? Um, something. She has a lot of books. 
I haven't read nearly all of them. Like one of her series has a bunch of trilogies and then anthologies and stuff like that in the series. So it's she's she's done a lot. What do you look for when you when you decide on an author to invest this kind of time in? Um basically if I can make it past the first couple of chapters and I'm still interested, I'm hooked, you know. So I mean, do you go into it knowing, okay, this person has a series ongoing, four books into it. I'm going to check out this first one, or no. you just, you know, cruising around, picking stuff out in fantasy and science fiction and just reading through it. Since, since I was a kid, it was usually based on the cover. Just the um, cover. <laughs> seriously. And sometimes I'll have somebody, you know, suggest a book and I'll go check it out, you know, and that's how I got on to um, uh, the guy that you were talking about with the egg. Uh, Oh, Andy Weir. The Martian, the egg. Yeah, Andy Weir, thank you. You know, yeah. so somebody suggested The Martian, and so I went and, you know, read The Martian, and that was amazing. You know, but most of the time, it's based on the titles. I'll just jump into something like Overdrive, where I used to go into the library, and you know, I'll just go through, and I'll just glance at all the covers, and it's like if the title's interesting or the cover's interesting, then I'll flip it open, read for a chapter, and if I like it, then I'll go and try to see if I can finish it. The the library is a different animal though because they don't really break the genres down. You know what's they, a different animal? The library. Oh yeah, well I the, mean, the one here it, breaks it down into sci-fi and fantasy, and that's oh, yeah? you know that's what I like. So, <laughs> but so it's just based on cover still. For the most part, if I'm just you know in the mood to see somebody new, but I mean I've I've got so many authors that I like. <laughs> there's usually a book coming out by one of them yeah that's the thing though isn't it speculative fiction is relatively new and it's got a lot of different people pr uh, producing stories yeah um why did you pick uh her over say a robin hood or or hob or a, a pierce anthony or something like that like a classic so i mean it's been out uh, there for a really long time the cover looked really cool. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying like in, in terms of this conversation, why him and not like a pure oh. Anthony or something along those lines? I see. I see. Um, well, I mean, when you asked me who I wanted to do, uh, I had just finished the first novel. And it was like, it was so good that I was trying to get the second one from my library at that time. So it really <laughs> kind of landed, you know, it's like, this is who I'm into at the moment. This is who I'd be interested in talking about. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of authors that I'd love to talk about. So, If we hadn't decided on him, would you have been able to, or would you have wanted to finish the series as fast as you did? Definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I probably wouldn't have finished it quite as fast because there's, you know, a bunch of other things that I wanted to uh, listen to and read and stuff like that at the same time. But I, I'm not, angry at all that i did because it's just such an amazing series yeah, he's he's a fascinating guy i mean in terms of the one video i watched two videos of him one he was at san diego comic-con and he was being interviewed for like seven minutes by somebody off camera you know they never showed themselves and he seemed a little bit annoyed you know because <laughs> he wasn't really into the conversation and the second video was him at a book signing and he was on top of it he was incredibly entertaining him and uh, what's his name, Luke uh, Daniels, Daniels, were basically back and forth. They are joking, they're riffing, they were talking about the, uh, the the nuts and bolts of audio recording and this, this that, and the other thing. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it, he is a character. Yeah, and yeah. it works in terms of being able to. I mean, his audience was into it; they liked it. <laughs> Yeah, I saw um, uh, one of his um, uh, little preview vids for his uh, uh, Giants book, I think it was, was him arguing with himself or something like that. <laughs> what? Really? Yeah. So it'd be like he had you know him in one room and then him in a different room or something like that. And he was talking up to the author with one of the characters that he was you know pretending to play. But it, it, was, it was fun. He, he's an interesting guy. 47 years old. Unfortunately, he does not have a lot of information about him. Who is Kevin Hearn? Um, I know he does not own a dog because I'm looking at the frequently asked questions. So he does not own a Irish wolfhound named wow. Oberon. <laughs> uh, 
Um, Oberon has a Twitter account, but you know. <laughs> yeah, I see that, but it's not even an Irish or Irish Wolfhound. It's like another kind of dog, isn't it? On the Twitter, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I follow it, but it. I haven't really paid attention. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> when did you uh, When did you start following Oberon? Oh, when I followed Kevin Hearn, it was in the suggested. So there's like Oberon, and then there was uh, the um, Owen Kennedy, which is the the Arc Druid and stuff like that. So I followed a couple of those. I don't know oh, if he's the one that actually does the tweets, or if it's kind of like all the Harry Potter ones, where it's just random people. But I wonder if I follow Kevin Hearn. I was incredibly impressed that he got back to me. <laughs> I am following well, he's him. Really active on Twitter. 24,000 followers. He only follows 231 people. <sighs> it's fascinating. How's your Twitter working out? All right. Um, I don't actively go after new people, but I you know, always get a couple a day that you know end up following me. I don't know if they're uh, just you know, like for like or if it's... You know... Yeah, it's hard to say, right? I'm yeah. 5,000. That's pretty damn good. Yeah, most of those I think were like for like or follow for follow or whatever you want to call it. Do you think that Tall Tale is just a, I mean, did it grab people? Because, I mean, obviously it is very good. It's very well done. But are people hungry for that type of platform for short fiction uh -huh. and audio recordings and whatnot? I've had uh, some people reach out to me and just, you know, say that they really love the idea, especially people who have gone through similar things that I went through with like, you know, their eyes or they had a parent who went blind or something like that. So the story behind its creation really tends to hit people more than the project itself, as far as I can tell, as, at least as far as what people have, you know, contacted me with. But um, I'm not really sure. <laughs> you know, I just, I kind of put it out there and hope people pick it up. And they have, I mean, you've not yeah. really done much marketing, right? I mean, I think I discovered you on Reddit. You were asking for fiction. I think this is when you first got started, but I'm not even sure. You might have already been doing it for a little while. No, you were uh, probably within the first month or two that you submitted that story. But yeah, because that was right around the time that uh, io9 did that interview with me. It, it was the same yep. post. So that I think that was my second or third month that that happened. But... <laughs> it's compelling. I mean, when mixed with the the story of why you started it and what audiobooks gave to you when you were going through your your medical issues, I mean, yeah. it, it definitely draws attention to it and makes it something that people can get behind. Um, yep. I mean, why did Kevin Hearn pop so much? What did people resonate with him? That's mainly the question, right? I mean, what made him popular? Was it just because he's a good storyteller? I mean, that's that's interesting, isn't it? I mean, why are some people pop and other people don't? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I know that with like um, uh, Brandon Sanderson, he really pushed himself at first. Uh, he like went up and down the West Coast driving from bookstore to bookstore, giving people free books and saying, T if you like it, tell anybody, you know, that you like it. Um, and so he really pushed himself. I don't know if Kevin Hearn did something similar or if it was just, he submitted it to the publisher and they were like, this is amazing. I have no idea. But I mean, it's... How, how much money did that cost? I mean, that's thousands and thousands of dollars to take a, you know, box and box, boxes and boxes of books and put them in your trunk and then drive up and down the West Coast. No, that's yeah. actually the, the fun part of the story. I guess this is something that uh, a friend of mine told me recently is uh, he was originally supposed to only have two book signings. And it's like you go out to this place in California and then you go out to this place a week later. And that was all the budget they were going to give him when he was a new author with them. And so he said, well, how much money can I have to do it myself? He said, okay, well, here's $1,000. And that's all you get. It's like, okay, well, can I have a box of books to give away? And they're like, okay, here's a box of books. <laughs> and so he found another author and they split gas and they split motel room you know, uh, payments and stuff like that. And they both went up and down the West Coast every year for about a, a grand just you know trying to to push their books and it took him two or three years and then he exploded what about the other guy I, i'm not even sure who it was <laughs> I, I was hearing this story secondhand from my friend so. that would be so interesting though if it was him and the friend is like wait I did the same <laughs> thing how come i didn't pop or it was actually kevin hearn 
there's another story that I like uh, about another origin story, I guess you could call it, which was uh, Stephen Meyer or Mayer. I'm not sure which one it is. I think it's Meyer, but uh, he did the Magic 2.0 series. Great series. I love it. Um, but he started out by uh, having a web comic. And so he started this web comic and then he used that to kind of build up a fan base so he could give his book to the fan base. And I guess that's how he got his big break. University of Cambridge. He's an English bloke. Who's that? Stephen Meyer. Stephen Meyer's oh. a stand-up comedian. I um, am looking at the director of the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute. I don't think he's the same guy. It's uh, uh, M-E-Y-E-R. M-E-Y-E-R, yeah. Stephen C. Meyer is who I'm looking at. Stephen Meyer. Oh, yeah, okay. I don't know. I just look at Magic 2.0, that would be him. <laughs> Magic 2.0? It's yeah. a comic or is a just uh, it's a literature? No, Magic 2.0 is a, a comedic book series, which that that's a, a really fun book series. But... Scott Meyer. Oh, Scott Meyer. Oh, I'm sorry. I always get that wrong. You're right. <laughs> Scott Meyer. That's why. And he's an old man too. Forty six. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's old, but... Well, he's like five years older than me, so I mean, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> no, people do say it, it, that's how you how how you get it to work for you. I mean, you you find you bust your butt. I mean, you you drop your books into people's lap for free, and they start talking about it, and potentially other people get your book somehow. I thought about I just went to to Europe for a, a weekend and thought I would bring my my first novel with me is leave it in the hostel after I left just to see what would happen. <laughs> That's a cool I mean, idea. Yeah, but I didn't do it though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, but, that's what Tall Tale TV is about is I'm trying to be a, an influencer. You know, if I could get to the point where I can actually make a couple people's careers that would just tickle me pink, you know, that's... Has anything know. happened? Has anybody kind of taken off from your platform and kind of gone? Not to a big extent. Um, I've help, helped some people sell a couple of books, you know, but beyond that, I don't think I've really pushed anybody's career to the next level or anything. But I mean, you're about to reach that year mark. <laughs> I'm about to reach that year mark in June. You're about to reach oh, that nice. year mark. <clears throat> yeah, I'm almost at that year mark too. But what I mean, are you satisfied with the way your first year has gone? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, as far as YouTube, I, I got to get on a podcast because apparently I'll make it much better as a podcast according to everybody. I mean, it's multifaceted, <laughs> you know? right? I mean, you're doing the same material. Yeah. It just gives you an outlet that, I mean, some people go to YouTube, other people go to iTunes. Yeah, my, my thing was I wanted to give people a way to put a video on their webpage if they wanted to or put it in an email, you know, that they could send. And so that's why I started with YouTube. Mm -hmm. But um, as far yeah, as YouTube... Really it's not it's very hard to market a podcast i mean you can't really like take right. the podcast and put it on your website typically but you need the audio in an mp3 format and that's hard to get from a podcast uh, there's ways to do it like if you go through libsyn you can actually um have a embed link if i understand right i haven't done it yet so i could be wrong but i'm, I'm guessing like bilberry and stuff like that are the same way I, are you going to host with uh Post hostings? Are you going to host? What's, what is the site called? Libsync? Libsyn. Okay. Are you going to host with L-I-B-S-Y-N. Yeah, yeah I expensive. think that's what I'm going to go with. <laughs> Aren't they like 100 bucks well, a month? On... No, no, it's like nine, you know. Or like, like up to a certain amount of gigabytes, though. Right, but if you're talking audio, you know, that it's – I got to do the math. It might be the $9 – deal or the $15 deal or something like that but I wouldn't be willing to do you know more than like 20 so they have an unlimited and the unlimited was like ghastly oh yeah that was I think that one was like 70 bucks or something I, I can't remember offhand but yeah it was much more expensive but if you need that you're making the money to pay for it you know that's true right I mean unfortunately I mean, you've got the website too I have the website you obviously invested there that's where I host my pod my podcast it ends up hurting you though. I wow. think they limit the amount of time, um, the amount they actually post. I think something along those lines. If you go oh, on yeah. Podcast Republic, I only have like five or six episodes for each of my shows. 
that's huh. kind of upsetting. It's like, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How does that work? How come you guys just decided to cut me off at five or six? I know that they say the big problem with uh, hosting on your website is that um, when people go and listen to it, it can actually crash your website. Oh, it's not happened it, yet for yeah. me. Right, yeah. But that's that's the only reason I'm thinking of going with Libsyn is you know, <laughs> I'd rather that not happen down the road. Yeah, but, I yeah. don't know. I mean, who knows, right? I mean, everything is a learning experience. Yeah. I'd like to hear what happens. That's supposedly the best one. I think that's what all the big fish kind of use, like which one or whatnot. Yeah, Lipson, whatever it is. <laughs> oh, yeah, Lipson. Yeah, and this is like one of those things that I've read that I cannot say out loud, and I can like picture it. I know it starts with an <laughs> LBY, and if I was going to look it up, I'd probably go LBY podcast hosting <laughs> platform. It'll come up. Yeah, <laughs> it'll come up. It's like I don't need to know all the letters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as far as the the youtube goes i'm really happy because apparently you know most people don't make it to 100 in their first year you know so to, to hit 500 i'm quite happy with that yeah man that is really awesome i mean that's amazing that's amazing i mean yeah. obviously you've got something and it <laughs> i don't know you're not like a pretty girl <laughs> which is usually <laughs> which is usually hey. somehow you know people will pop when they're pretty girls or when right. they're like 18 year old dudes are videotaping suicides in the japanese forest or something i mean they pop then oh, too God. i gather yeah that guy makes millions of dollars a month oh, yeah. off his youtube channel and it's like yeah, I, he's everybody hates him everybody. Yeah, he makes millions of dollars a month yep I don't yeah know. i don't get it yeah, the, the audiobook stuff is definitely fairly niche in uh, uh, YouTube. There's there's basically me, uh, one or two other guys, and then all the rest of it is creepypasta. You know? yeah, yeah, exactly. All creepypasta. Yeah, we talked about that. And I know <clears> most <throat> of the other guys. but I mean, it would be nice. I mean, do you think that a Kevin Hearn would help your your channel if he decided to post like a short story with you? Or do you think it would kind of just be the same? Um, it would probably help only in that people are looking for him, you know, but if, if it's a name that people aren't searching for, then it would probably just, you know, be a slightly more popular video, not something that's going to drive a lot of traffic to me. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I had a uh, really good opportunity to talk to a guy who has just finished a fantasy series with Tor. And I don't know why he agreed to be on my podcast, but he did. And we talked for a while. And, you know, when his book was published, the last one in his series, you know, I watched kind of him do the the marketing on that. But I didn't really see any increase in traffic in terms of like listeners or whatnot. So I don't know about searching. I don't know. It's it's all kind of a, a mystery to me right now. <laughs> it's yeah. like that's, sometimes that's it works, sometimes thing. it doesn't. I mean, you but, don't I mean, know I, until it happens, right? You don't yeah. know, and then it's like, oh, now I'm an expert. <laughs> it goes back. I mean, I, I, sorry, go ahead. No, it please. goes back. And I was going to say, gonna say... Back to what we were just talking about with Hearn. I mean, why do some people pop and other people don't pop? I mean, who did Brandon Sanderson drive up and down the West Coast with? I mean, there's no buddy cop show with Sanderson and the other writer going, we both made it, buddy. No, there's just Sanderson okay. on the top of the mountain. Plus, you look uh, at Gaiman and Pratchett, you know. <laughs> right. It was three of them, and they they went up, and unfortunately, <laughs> Pratchett didn't make it back. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, I'm sad. <laughs> yeah, that poor guy. <laughs> Did you hear about a? Uh, um, they're making a television series out of his. Uh, has, uh, yeah. His books. Uh, the the one that they combined on. Um, we no. talked about that in the last podcast. No, not um. Good Omens, right? Is that what it's called? Right. No, it's his. Uh, it's his other one. The whole series. What's it called? Huh. No way. Yeah. At the Discworld series. Yes, Discworld. Thank you. Whew. Oh my god! <laughs> Finally, I don't know why they didn't do it before. They made a couple yeah, that, of movies, but that was it. I haven't even gotten. I have not had the opportunity to watch those mov uh, movies either. But yeah, they're uh, making a series of Discworld. Hopefully, it's good. <laughs> That's the best news I've heard all year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hopefully it's good. I mean, uh, the Sword of Shannara got destroyed. Terry Goodkind. Did you like it? Yeah, I, I don't know why people hated it so much. I mean, I, I hate understand people things. I hate when they have like teenagers playing all the roles. 
yeah yeah i could see that but you know i i i liked what they were trying to do with it i guess you know it's i it i didn't hate my it. heart that <laughs> fantasy is being made you know what i mean usually fantasy is overlooked as not makeable and when yep. they try right but it breaks my heart when they try and it fails it means the next great series is going to have a harder time exactly but i think game of thrones really opened the door for a lot of that so. yeah and what did i hear about game of thrones oh yeah they're doing the the guys who are doing game of thrones might do a star wars series for hbo <laughs> nice or something along those lines. I don't know. I got to stop talking because I don't even know what I'm talking about at this point. We're just misleading everybody. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> he knows nothing. He doesn't even read the books he talked about. No, I do want to read some Kevin Hearn because it does sound like an interesting story and I'm um, uh, a series. And I'm incredibly interested in urban fantasies too. I think they're a great yeah. way to tell a story. You have the world that you're living in. There's your setting. It's easy. Yep. And you just uh, put some magic and some fantasy elements into it and juxtapose it, it with the old gods. Yeah. I mean, putting the gods on Earth is interesting too. Yeah. Making them characters. I don't think I'm doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't Jesus think I'm really so making fun. Because he that? just. That when he put Jesus in there, it was so much fun because, you know, they can appear as whatever people picture them as. So this guy showed up and uh, he looked apparently like the, the guy from the Old Spice commercials. you know, Because <laughs> somebody was like, well, Jesus was black. So, you know, <laughs> so he came down as a black guy. We're just kind of hanging out, drinking a beer and, you know, shooting the breeze with him. It's like, that's awesome. I think, I think it's appropriate <laughs> to say the Tide commercials now. Oh, is that where he's at now? And do you do you don't watch uh, football? Oh no, I don't, and I also don't have TV. I just have Netflix. <laughs> the uh, oh man, I do everything on the internet now. Yeah, I don't have cable. I hate <laughs> commercials so much, but I watch the Super Bowl, and during the Super Bowl, every other commercial was a Tide commercial, and they were riffing on other products. So you know, they did like a a riff on the Old Spice commercial, and they had that guy from Old Spice in there, and he says, "Do you think this is an Old Spice commercial?" But nice. it's not. It's a Tide commercial. And <laughs> <laughs> so I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh -huh. Um, man. So I don't even think that we talked about Kevin Hearn at all this entire time. As far as a person, or no? I mean, we've had. Oh, we uh, just got so about... sidetracked. I guess, I guess so. <laughs> we've <laughs> talked about a bunch of stuff in this podcast. <laughs> know, it's hard because new writers you don't know exactly what their their career arc is going to be at the end of the day i mean he's only been writing for eight years seven years successfully yeah. i mean that's nothing compared to the time that a you know terry pratchett was writing and his decades yeah. of effort into his series his books and, and he died for the long so, I mean, time yeah there was a period there at the end of the story so you knew exactly what he accomplished you could look back and say, okay, that's Terry Pratchett. That's the guy who did that. But now this guy, Kevin Hearn, he's still doing that. And what is he going to accomplish at the end of the day? I mean, yeah. uh, Jared Fogel, you know, the, the pedophile dude, and I was, <laughs> he came back <laughs> in the news. And I'm, honestly, I mean, five, six years ago, if you said Jared Fogel, he would have been, you know, the subway guy. But today, Jared Fogel is the horrible dude that's stuck in prison someplace. So, I mean, it's very interesting yeah. that what could happen to somebody in the years to come in terms of their career and in terms of what they're making and what they're doing. Um, I mean, Kevin Hearn, well, eight years in, seems to be a success. And we don't yeah, know exactly I got no doubt how that happened. Going. <laughs> yeah, continue to be a success. But as far as the Iron Druid Chronicles go, but you've not read the other stuff. Right. Um, from what I understand, people loved it, you know, um, but I think he's done with the Iron Druid Chronicles. I think I heard that the ninth was the last book. I could be wrong, but, you know, his uh, his Giants one, uh, people absolutely loved it. So I think if he just keeps writing, you know, with the same kind of style or whatever, he's probably golden. Well, these aren't really but, like long novels are, either, are they? They're about like 400 pages or so. Am I wrong? Yeah, I'd say that they're on the, the shorter-ish side. You know, not Game of Thrones size for sure, you know, or anything like that. But uh, 
Um, Brandon Sanderson side. <laughs> he writes <laughs> thousand page magnus opuses too. I mean, they're huge books. Here's the thing though, is that for somebody to keep me in a series for, you know, seven full books, plus a lot mm -hmm. of novellas, and then I still want to read the rest of it, you know, usually it gets old after a couple of books if they don't keep, you know, mixing stuff in. There's quite a few authors that I've kind of dropped off after the first couple of books just because it doesn't seem to evolve at all. But he definitely has that ability. What about picking it up? Did you have a Brandon Sanderson issue getting into it or was it right away you're hooked? Uh, a Brandon Sanderson issue? I mean, you had a hard time reading Name of the Wind, Patrick Ruthless. Oh. <laughs> took you a, a number of times to get into it, and I'm having gotcha. a hard time with Brandon Sanders, and I cannot get into that guy's work at all. Gotcha. No, that was one of the, the things that he's good at is he knows how to start a book where it just kind of sucks you in immediately. It's like I started listening, and within a couple of minutes, like, yeah, I'm going to love this book. So he knows how to start. That's that's a lost art is, you know, the first line and the first page and the first chapter. Yeah, you my, get it my wife going. says I struggle with that. <laughs> if we could just figure out a way to get your first page not to suck. Like, Thanks, babe. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate that one. That's awesome. <laughs> Gee, brutal. No, she didn't say that like that. But I mean, that's just what she yeah. told me just like an hour or two ago. <laughs> yeah, you oh, can read entire how-to books on how to write a first line so it's yeah, definitely I mean, important it is important because that's exactly the first thing somebody is going to look at with your work and say okay am i in here am i interested in what's going to happen later on yeah and that's <sighs> like me when i find you know new new authors and stuff like that uh, if i'm just browsing through i'll listen to an audiobook or open a book for the first page or two and if it, if it doesn't suck me in fairly quickly, you know, I just move on to the next thing. So you, you can't wait a couple of chapters like Rothfuss did. You know, he's yeah. a fluke. The he's rest of the fluke. book was had to be just amazing for him to get to the point that he did, mm -hmm. you know, because that first chapter or two is just brutal. I wonder if I'll <laughs> ever produce a third book. I'm starting to doubt it <laughs> seriously at this point. Um, but you are also, you're in a unique situation in that you are a content um judger as well people send you their work mm -hmm. and you have to make a decision whether or not to invest your time in producing that work as your own work in a way right. acting it so i mean yeah. do you think that that helps you get into the stuff because oh. i struggle with that too when i'm on like reddit and i produce a challenge or something like that now write a 5,000 word story and I put it up on Reddit and I want people to read it. I have to read other people's work too. It's kind of the, you know, the social contract that we all sign, you know, you're mm -hmm. going to read my work. Yeah. I'm going to read your work. I have a horrible time getting into people's work, horrible time. I get, I lose interest really fast. In fact, the more I write, the faster my interest wanes on people's literature. I cannot get <laughs> into it. Um, how do you get past that? Um, that's a good question. Because <laughs> I would uh, just say everybody sucks and nobody's getting on my show. Uh, <laughs> we're in <laughs> your shoes. It's like, okay, I can't read this story. <laughs> no. Um, I think a, a big part of it is that, you know, I did critiquing for all my writing friends for so long that I'm used oh, to yeah. seeing stuff in its roughest form. You know, and I would still read 200 pages of extremely rough content, you know. That's and tough. So I don't have that problem where... If I'm reading it because somebody's asking me to, I, I don't just stop where it's like, oh, this is so boring or anything like that. So I don't have that issue just because it's kind of ingrained into me. Um, but as far as judging stuff, whether or not I want to represent it, uh, that's a good question. I haven't really had too much issue because most of the stuff that I've got, I've really liked. You know, it's like obviously there's a, a wide range of ability and technique, but some of the ideas for the story, if nothing else, are you know very interesting. So, I mean, in terms of what you're doing, do you feel like it's a challenge to take a mediocre story and turn it into a compelling piece of literature or yes. audio workmanship? Yeah. Uh, so that's actually something that uh, is really big with audiobook narrators is figuring out how to take writing that does not translate well into the spoken word it's like your sentence structure just doesn't match a normal speech pattern. And you got to be able to make that sound like it does. 
which is a lot harder than it sounds like it you know would be but um eventually you just kind of get tricks to where you kind of add imaginary punctuation or you change <sighs> the feel of the sentence you know but you can't change the wording because that's their original work they spent mm -hmm. a lot of time making that they poured over it that's their baby you don't touch their baby but you try to make it as close to natural as you can so it's it's a process <laughs> i mean i imagine that it takes a lot of effort i mean Sometimes. to me it seems impossible to take somebody's work and decide you know what i'm gonna take a breath in the middle of the sentence because it obviously needs a comma or some <laughs> kind of uh, something here yeah the more you do it the the easier it becomes because you just kind of get this you know knack for okay this is how it feels like it could flow so now i don't notice it nearly as much as i did starting out but i mean starting out i could you know spend an hour or two trying to read a couple stories you know because i was just trying to figure out how to make it work but now it's it's pretty quick but it's still i'll have to redo a line because i went and read it just straight and it's like nope that didn't work let's try it a different way eh, let's try it another way you know but do you wish in. that you had a a more variety of authors do you find yourself kind of stuck within the same kind of group no um i mean my wife makes up 25 percent of my content you know? <laughs> but, but that's uh so that i can keep a backlog of about three months ahead of me you know that way i don't get in trouble yeah it's like it's like well i got nothing to read you guys this week you know so she helps me out that way but for the most part um the majority of my stories are one-offs you know occasionally i have somebody come back for two uh like you know you came back for another one um and then i'll have somebody like robert who comes back and i've probably done four or five stories for him just because you know <laughs> he's an awesome writer i i love his stuff he loves my stuff so it kind of works out but for the most part it's one or two pieces per person usually one do would you want more work from people sure or do you prefer it to be like that Why? no um i mean i love having the variety because just seeing all the different styles out there you know i just uh talked to a gal in greece you know she's a neurosurgeon and she wrote this you know short story and you know meeting all these people is amazing and seeing their different writing styles you know is just really cool but some of them i definitely wish would come back because i just loved it so much but usually if i start thinking that's like you know who i really miss patricia wayne and then she comes back, you know, uh, a week later or something like that. You know, it's like, oh, wow, that worked. So, but a lot of them do end up coming back if, if they really liked what I did. So it, it, it works out. You know, I, I, I love it. It's, a it's fun intimidating process. for me. Honestly, I can't, I can't listen to my own words being read. It's like, okay, uh, the ball's going to get dropped any second now. And it's going to be a bad story. And I'm going to be embarrassed. But I wrote it and I can't listen to this anymore. And I'll stop listening. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I was definitely like that. Um, I actually trained, uh, I say trained, I uh, uh, practiced for about a year before I started my project. And I was like that during that year, but I had to get over it because I didn't want to put anything out for these other authors where I didn't, you know, listen to it. And it's like, eh, you know, yeah. so it's got to be good enough for me before I'll put it out. Well, the the gnome piece that I that you uh, that you read of mine, I listened to that all the way through, and I was like, "Huh, that's pretty cool." I actually wrote that story a little bit, added <laughs> a new beginning to it, and I haven't done you know the 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 sealing the deal of it. But I mean, it's it's like three times as big as it was. <clears throat> but Odin, I cannot I cannot listen to it past like the first page. Like I'm afraid. Really? Yeah, I love that story it was too. Such a good story. I I love the story. <laughs> I want to find a home for it someplace. <laughs> And oh, um, I can't, I just, I'm afraid that if I listen to you read it, I'm going to say, okay, it's really not that good of a story after all. And I don't oh, want it was a great story. <laughs> no, you, you're not alone though. I've actually had a couple authors and it always surprises me. It's like, thank you so much. My wife said it's amazing. Yeah. I'm not going to listen to it. It's like, yeah. What? <laughs> I can't do it. Yeah, it's really okay. tough. How does your wife feel about it when uh, you read her story? She love it or is she kind oh, of like yeah. hesitant? Yeah. No, we, we're having a blast with it because it's finally a project that we can do together. You know, it's like in, in the past, I would do computer art, but she would do marker art and, you know, she'd uh, do Sculpey, you know, clay masks and just all these different crafty things. But we never had anything to do together. And so now um, we're, we're working on this together. And so we always have something to talk about and brainstorm on and stuff like that. So 
it's been really, really fun and I guess good for our relationship. So it worked out wonderful. How's her literary kind of working out? Is it, is it, she doing more with her work now? Is she getting more confident with the writing or sending stuff out, collecting it? What do you mean as far as sending stuff out? Oh, like uh, trying to get pieces published or. Oh, no, no. She's just doing this for fun. Just for fun. (laughs) Yeah, no, neither one of us ever wanted to be a professional author. So, I mean, she might uh, eventually publish this, you know, just so she can say she's a published author, (laughs) self-publish. But for the most part, she's just doing it for fun. You know, she's, she's written like a um, a romance stuff like that back in high school and, you know, afterwards and whatnot, but she never really took it seriously. You know, kind of like me, it's like, I always just wrote just for fun, just so I could get stuff out of my head. You know, never thought I was going to go into being an author or anything like that at all. So this is a bit of a surreal experience. <laughs> it's neat that you're actually starting to write again. Because I remember when we first spoke, you said, nope, it's not me. Yeah. I don't want to write. I'm I'm definitely never going to do that. And then I turn around, and the next thing I know, you're writing two stories. I don't know. How many have you produced so far? Just the two or? Um, let's see. My first story was one of mine so that I could kind of show people what I was doing. Uh, and then I did the one that you've heard recently. And there was another one. Oh, I did street cred. That's what it was. Yeah. So I've had, I believe three of my own. Yeah. Street cred was a, uh, I saw a uh, writing prompt on Reddit and I just had to write it. <laughs> Is that the one where the guy takes uh, the contract out on himself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that was good. That was nice. <laughs> yeah, <it's... laughs> so i mean uh, yeah. <laughs> our conversation about kevin hearn i liked it i like him i'm gonna start reading i'm gonna try to read one of his novels it's too what late is... at this particular point in time but i mean Pick maybe up one of go... his novellas. well i think i'll start with the iron druid chronicles i'll start with book one and see how whether or not it hooks me okay. i mean i'm trying to explore first sentence hooks <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can't remember if his first sentence was killer, but I mean, definitely the first page worth of writing was, it sucked me in. So it's an interesting concept, a 2000 year old druid. It's yeah, exactly. Concept. And he seems like an interesting writer. I'm I'm looking forward to, you know, now that he's on my radar, I could watch and see what happens you know, with yeah. his, the rest of his career. Um, hopefully I live long enough to see what happens with the rest of his career. But <laughs> I mean, that's pretty cool. Um, do you want to add anything to Kevin Hearn, or do you want to mention anything about what you're doing that people should be aware of? Um, geez, uh, check him out on Twitter. Kevin is amazing, and he's constantly posting stuff on Twitter, personal and uh, you know professionally related. So he's just a fun guy to follow. So is Oberon. It's hilarious. Um, as far as my own stuff, I should be having a podcast come out hopefully within the month. Uh, for people who don't want to listen on YouTube, otherwise, check me out on YouTube. Or if you're an author, hit me up at talltaletv.com. Chris, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate you being willing to uh, come back on the show and talk about this author and, and what you're working on. It means a Absolutely. lot. Absolutely. I love it. <laughs>